Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. It isn't very often that an expected winner declines to run for election, especially in this city and for the city council, where last year there were 202 candidates running for the 51 seats. But that's what Mark Winston Griffith did last year. Instead, this longtime champion of community empowerment is the executive director of the Brooklyn Movement Center, and he's my guest today, and I'm delighted to have you. Great to be here. Thank you. So the Brooklyn Community Development whatever, Brooklyn Movement Center Movement Center <laughs> right right is something you created. Yes, I co-founded it with a group of other activists and organizers in Bed Stuy and in Crown Heights about uh, about three years ago, about three and a half years ago. Yeah. That's nothing new to you to start an organization. No, um, I'm a serial social entrepreneur, <laughs> um, so I've been on the starting end of quite a few different institutions and organizations. How did you come to do this? To the Brooklyn Movement Center? No, oh, the whole thing. <laughs> the whole where did thing. you start? I don't, you know, I, I can't, I'm not sure if I can identify exactly where the impulse to, to be an organizer and activist and, you know, be in social change came from. Um, you know, my parents were, were civil servants. My father was a truant officer. My mother was a secretary um, for the fire department. Um, but there was always sort of under underground uh, a social consciousness that that I grew up with and you know when I went to I went to public school and then went away to high school for boarding school and I was one of a few black students there and ended up becoming the first black president in the school's history uh. and then went to Brown University and ended up becoming an activist there and in our my senior year was part of a, a group of students who, uh, who had a series of, of protests that really transformed the university. So I think that, that it gave me a sense of my own power and gave me a sense of, of social right and wrong and the need to be in the mix. And so when I graduated, that's what I wanted to do. And the need that you also could succeed because you really had some great successes then. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when I... I, I you could really see a difference. When I was at Brown and we, you know, my senior year, I have never worked with a more talented group of people. And they were all um, black students my age, but they were just, they were, and, and they have all gone on to different things, not necessarily in social change work, but they were just really smart and very great strategists. And so I, I had an appreciation for that. And did you, where did you come up with, I mean, you then were a co-founder of a credit union. Right. Uh, where did you decide to get into the money part of it, the financial part of it. You know, it. we... What did uh, somebody call you? Something... The, the, we, were, we were dubbed the world's first hip-hop credit union. Right, that's right. And that's because of a speech I gave when we started where I likened the starting of this credit union to, you know, what it happens in hip-hop where you take an old, um, an old song and you put a new spin over it. And so we were trying to put a new spin on the world of banking. And I, I sort of back, backed into it because I, was, I worked for an elected official and I worked for a community development organization. And I, we, I eventually saw sort of what we now think of as economic justice um, as a, a, a very big missing part in Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights. That is, we saw you know, that we were able to elect elected officials at will. Um, we were able to have social and cultural institutions, but there weren't a lot of economic institutions that not just served mm. us, but, but, but actually were owned and operated by us as well. And that's what distinguishes a credit union from a bank, is that it's actually owned and operated by the people who are members of it. Mm -hmm. I was in high school many, many years ago, and uh -huh. we had a student co-op. Okay. And so we started with a co-op movement and the whole thing, and we, we all owned shares in this place, and it right. sold art and music supplies, and it was great. Right. And it gives you then a sense of what you can go on and do. I mean, later on I got involved in housing. Right. Not for the public, but, well, it was in a way. But it was always sharing and that whole concept. Right. Do you think that's a natural step then to, I guess it is, to change in community empowerment? I, I think so, because if, if, you, if you're part of a co-op, then you have, to, you have to believe in democracy. Mm -hmm. You have to believe in shared work and responsibility. Um, you, have to build, you have to believe in, in community building. Mm -hmm. And so, that is what I think has given me a grounding or has been at least an integral part of everything else I've done since then. I mean, it, it, it really gave me a sense of, you know, we don't have to sort of step outside of the neighborhood 
to, to build institutions and to create our to recreate our environment, we can do it from within. So you live in a very changing neighborhood now. Yes. Ed Stuy, Crown Heights. A yes, I, yeah. technically I live in Crown Heights, what's called North Crown Heights, which is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, right two blocks away from the borderline of Bedford Stuyvesant and Crown Heights. So you're seeing a lot of change. A lot of change. I mean, you know, just as an example, there's a Connecticut muffin two blocks away from me. You know, my I've been in some form on that block, my grandmother moved there in 1952. Um, her sister moved next door in 1948, um, and then her brother lived on the other side. So, you know, my family has been there for a long time. My wife and I bought the house some years ago, but I've been living in that house now since 1985. And I, when I was on, you know, when I lived there as an adult, there was not, not literally not one white person on the block. Mm. Um, and now I would say, you know, 90% of the people who are buying into the, into the uh, block uh. Are, are white. And I would say about 30% of the block right now I I is white. And it's just, you know, and so, but, but people have been clamoring for change for a long time. Not, I mean, for, you know, working class, middle class black folks have been looking for a change on the commercial strips, in mm -hmm. the quality of housing. And so, in many ways, gentrification becomes exactly what you've asked for. <laughs> Interesting. I, I, I first, I guess, visited Bed-Stuy with Robert Kennedy when he started his right. Bed the Bed-Stuy restoration and right. all that project. And I'm two blocks away from there. Oh, really? Yeah. So, how has that impact lasted? Was that a, did that, what effect did that have in that community? Well, I mean, bedford Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation is an anchor. It's, as, it's mm -hmm. the largest and oldest community development corporation in the country. And so it has fueled what, uh, what I and other people have come to see as a sense of possibility in the district, you know, in community development. It, it really embodies it in, in that way. Um, but I think that many of us, people who are children of the civil rights movement, um, see that that's an important model, but that... Um, Got to change. Yeah, it's, it's got to evolve. Um, and there's some variations of it, and it's still there, and I think it's still doing good work, but I think what the Brooklyn Movement Center and other organizations represent is sort of the next generation in iteration of it. So tell me what the Brooklyn, what, what you're doing. The Brooklyn Movement Center is a community organizing group and, you know, getting back to the sense of, of cooperativism, we are member owned and operated. So we have a membership made up of people who live and work in the neighborhood and we are committed to what's called direct action community organizing, which means that we use a s different techniques and methods to great social change, but one of them includes direct confrontation and pressing for change with elected officials and, and, and policymakers. So, you know, we are the quote-unquote rabble-rousers, but we try to do it in a very sophisticated way. And what are the issues? Well, we're a multi-issue group, but right uh -huh. now we're focusing on things that have kind of just bubbled up to the top. So right now we're focusing on, on, on education, um, pr uh, public education in community school district 16 which is in Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights. We focus on what's called food justice and the need to address the, the, the poor quality of food and unaffordability of food in, in the neighborhood, and that's led to the, the organizing of a food co-op. Um, we do some work around civic engagement, whereas we try to get people more involved in understanding what, what policies are infecting them, what, uh, what, where elected officials stand on the issues, and getting them to step up and, and hold elected officials more accountable. We have a group of women who have started a sh an anti-street harassment project where they're doing public edu education. It's sort of like a, a community health model where we're trying to build better relationships, particularly between men and, and women of color um, in, in public venues. And then um, we have a very strong communications uh, component. You know, as you know, I have some grounding in, in, in journalism, and so we're trying to build out a, 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 a citizen's journalism arm of our organization where local people are telling their story or reporting on what's going on, really to kind of uh, address the fact that um, there are very few metro sections uh, left, there are very few uh, publications that are reporting on what's going on in neighborhoods like that, and we feel that that could actually have a very big impact on... Well, that's a very a sensible kind of thing. I mean, that's what they, some people have tried to do and not too successful. Right. I mean, right? there is the, the, so the, the patch. The internet? But yes. Yeah. We, there was a patch, patch that just, the Bed-Stuy patch just left, in fact. Yeah, yeah. And then DNA. 
DNA <laughs> Info is actually probably one of the ones that does the most reporting right now. But it doesn't do that much. Um, no, because, I mean, you know, they're covering the whole city, yeah. and they have a couple of uh, reporters that are based, you know, that cover that beat. And I think they do a good job. It's just I think we want to cover it deeper. It's all on the internet, or do you have a? It's gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna be um, internet based. And no, no paper to no. give anybody. No. Do you think everybody is on the internet? I don't think everyone is on it, but right now <laughs> it's, it's the, it's the only way we can afford to do yeah. it. Um, you know, I, I just went to, I went through a course at, at the CUNY J School um, in entrepreneurial journalism, and there's this big. So tug of war about you know legacy publications and about the 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 uh, how long print will survive, um, and I think we we just I don't think we can afford it. And there are other print publications there, and I think committing yourself to print sort of holds you back in or some both. way. I mean, I, if I were thinking about it, I would say, well, the people who've lived there the longest, and um, who are still black or of color, may be the people who need more help, right? Absolutely. And they may be the people who don't have the computers. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So I always had a dream years ago even of a, like a teletype machine, or I guess it's a printer on the corner. <laughs> right, right. And when you go, you could just print out what's on right, there. Right, right. So what you really need are some printers that are available and some <laughs> paper, right, and right. you can just print it out. And people. I mean, you're, you're, you're absolutely There's right. nothing like seeing something either. I, I, yeah, absolutely. And, and, it's, and it's funny because I think in the black community in particular, you go into some of the bodegas and you will still see several different print um, publications, not just, you know, the Daily News mm -hmm. or the Post or something like that, but, um, you know, something like the Daily Challenge in, in, in Central Brooklyn, something called Our Time Press. All these different, uh, the recognition that there is still a market for that and there are people who don't consume their news on the yeah, Internet. It's interesting. So do you find, um, do you have really poor people living in your district? Of course. I mean, I, it's, but it's, 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 a, it's, it's a big mixture. I mean, Central Brooklyn, Bevis Stuyvesant, and Crown Heights, it has long been known as, um, you know, a, a poor neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, economically speaking at least, has been seen sort of as a, as a, as a parallel to, to Harlem. But like Harlem, you know, like Harlem, it has always had working and middle class mm -hmm. black folks. And like Harlem, it has undergone a significant shift. I mean, there was an article in the Times some years ago that said that that Harlem is no longer uh, okay. predominantly black, and so that is true actually Crazy. of a section of Bedford Stuyvesant is no longer predominantly black. So but things are all. changing. But not all. Do you have homeless people? A homeless population? Um. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that. Well, by definition, homeless, you know, don't have the home. So I don't know how you want to define it. But we have. There are actually two. Um, homeless shelters in the area, shelters. and many of those populations are coming are coming from the surrounding area. The shelter uh, that um, the big shelter that recently had all the publicity in the Times that's not in Bed Stuy, is Which it? one do you mean? Um, the, there was the one, one with the little the young girl. What was her name? That um, you know the where the homeless family. Shelter. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm remembering the that article. That was a big one. I think that was that's in Letitia's and Tisha's. District. Well, I mean, we, we right, we cover Bevis Ives and Cronite, so right, but it, it may have not been, it may have been outside of that area. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, do you, do you, are you taking up that cause also? Um, not yet. Yeah. I mean, I think eventually we will. I mean, at the very least, we're going to, uh, I think, address housing and affordable housing and getting tenants to demand better quality housing. And so, but you're not just going to lobby. Are you going to, are you going to, are you going to think of, actually finding a way to develop housing, affordable housing? Since I don't know if we will ever get into development. I mean, what happens oftentimes with, with community organizing groups is they start with lobbying and agitating and organizing and oftentimes leads to some kind of service delivery or, you know, running housing or something like that. So that could be in our future. Right now we're focusing on organizing, but, you know, but even in the work that we do now, it, it goes a little bit beyond organizing. There's, there's always some form of service delivery at the end of it because once you expose what's needed and once you start calling for what's needed, you inevitably get involved in the process of helping to create what, you know, to, to, so, to create what's needed. But, but the object is to move the person in elective office, right? Among other things. I mean, that's, yeah. not, the, that's not the only reason we're there, uh, but, no, but, but yes. And you're also pressuring businesses and everything. everything. Right. I mean, all the, all the, all the institutions and people who 
have the levers of power at their disposal. That's who, that's who we're creating relationships with, alliances with. You know, on, for some, it will be confrontational. On, with others, it, it will be nothing but collaboration and, um, and working very closely together. I worked at, I, I laugh because I worked at the Port Authority many years ago uh, during their community and government relations. And uh, we had the, the uh, religious group, what, the Centra, what was it, the Brooklyn uh, Central Brooklyn Churches? It, or? Well, it was all Solonsky kind of stuff, and that mm. confrontation, it just drives people crazy. And, <laughs> right. and I always loved it because you need that when you're inside something to move it. Right, exactly. You build the pressure, and then, I mean, you even go out and organize it. Right. So then you can move. So someday you're going to be in public office, right? <laughs> I, don't, I, I really don't know that. I mean, um, I, again, decided not to run in 2013. Um, my, my children are still very young. My organization is still very young. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I mean, and, and I'm not trying to be coy. No, I, I, I just, I literally it. don't know. What I, what I what talked about before and what I felt when I read your announcement was, this was my situation. I mean, I was always so stressed, and at that point I was just a district leader. But to go out at night or to go out to a meeting during the day, what are you going to do with your kids? Right. What's my husband doing? Did he right. mind? Blah, 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 and all and on. The guilt and the feelings that you're always torn exactly. is very great. We don't find that many people saying that publicly. And I know. So it I know. Makes and, it and, that's what, and that's that's what drove me to, to wrote, write the article in yeah, the first place, because yeah. I just felt like it, it's something that just kind of needed to be brought to the surface. But you loved running, if you didn't um, have the pressure. Yeah, I, I, what I loved was feeling like I was part of something that was more than just me. I mean, I was the person on the poster. It was my name. You have to feel that, <clears> or else <throat> it's just a plain ego. Exactly, and it, exactly. But I really felt like it was something more, and I felt like more than most local races, we, we, we focused on, on policy and, and specific issues, and that really turned me on. And it's actually what ultimately led me mm -hmm. to join with other people to start mm -hmm. the Brooklyn Movement Center, because I got re-inspired, because, uh, you know, in some ways, I had stepped away from that life. I had was working for citywide organizations where I wasn't working on a grassroots frontline level. What were you working on? Before? Um, well, before then, I was with um, a, a sustainable transportation campaign. I was with the Drum Major Institute for Public Policy, which was a public policy think tank. I was with an organization called um, the New, Econ New Economy Project or, or a Neighborhood Economic Development Advocacy Project, which did uh, economic justice work. So I was, I was writing. I was doing policy stuff. I was doing, working on economic justice work. And I, I, just, I had needed a breather from working all those years on the front line, having to worry about meeting payroll. And, you know, I swore I would never go back to it, and, look it, and here I am. <laughs> I used to dream of, of becoming mute because all I was doing was talking, <laughs> and I really wanted to do something. You know, right. when, how can you stop talking? So what are the, the major issues you're talking about now? Or Education, are you, are you part of the mayor's uh, campaign for pre-K? Yes, we are. Um, and we're, we're t I think we're taking a particular slice of it because what, what is a sort of a footnote to it is that he's, all, he's not only advocating for universal pre-K, but he's also looking to raise money um, for expanded after school, sure. particularly in, in middle schools. And so that's something, that's a, that's a drumbeat that we've been, we've been on for, for the last two years. We issued a report um, on Community School District 16, which essentially unearthed the, 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 the dearth of, um, of after-school programming in the district and really talked about the, the lack of coordination among schools and other stakeholders. And so we want to not only focus, work with him focusing on after school and, and universal pre-K, but also going back to a neighborhood-centric form of not only parent engagement, but just talking about schools. That is, understanding we'll still be dealing with mayoral control, but we don't abandon the district system that was created mm. and really go look to parents and other local stakeholders to be a part of that conversation. Are parents involved in the parents' associations now? Um, not, not, the, not to the extent that we feel is important. And that, was, that came out in our report, too. the graduation too. from high school rate? It's, it's, it's low. The co college readiness rates are, are very low. Unemployment? Um, unemployment is, is, is low. And what's, what's interesting about our district is, like you said, it's a changing demographic, but the, 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 the student population is still... Yeah. It's still very black, very low income. 
the, the middle class has, has fled and has not, is not really investing in, in, in the district. And so we need kind of all hands on deck. And we need, we need this district to be the district like you see in other neighborhoods where the middle class see it as a viable option. Um, that's not the case in community school. Some of the 16. younger people coming in are, have young families. Exactly. That's, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and, that's and they're choosing charter schools, mm -hmm. they're choosing private schools, they're choosing schools outside of the district. And the arrest records? Um, I mean, we're, we're not the highest in the city, but we're, 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 we're up the, there. Yeah. We're so up you there. have a high rate of incarceration? We do, and, and, and that's another issue that we d work with that we haven't, that we, I didn't discuss, is we also were part of, um, we're, we're also in, in involved in juvenile justice issues, trying to lower the, the rates, as well as we work very much on the stop and frisk campaign mm. and on the legislation that was re recently enacted and the two other pieces of legislation. The juvenile justice up. and the people, the need of a community. I mean, is this what's, co uh, do you, is the end goal the sustainable community that you have everything within that community you need to lead a dis decent life? Um, look. You don't uh, want it to be that separate. Right, I don't, exactly. I don't, I don't think we're looking for it to be that closed mm. of, of a community, but certainly you you want what you what you find in other healthy neighborhoods, whereas there there are places for families to thrive, there are places to eat, there are pla small mm -hmm. businesses can do well, get the um, decent food. Yeah, so I mean, it, we're, we're looking yeah. what I think is 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 what others in, in in healthy neighborhoods see as a baseline of of service and function. One of the things I think always and oh, an issue that I've always been interested in is what happens. Uh, on release from prison or jail, mm -hmm. um, the need for community support, exactly. and then to stop so you don't have the recidivism rate that we exactly, have. exactly. Because there are people spending their lives going in and out right. of the system, right? And that's uh, yeah. And we work very closely problem. with an organization called Center for New Leadership, which mm -hmm. is focusing just on that. That you know, sort of young people are being re-released into the the neighborhood, and there's just there, there's so few support systems. There's not, not only is there no j very few jobs. But just in every part of their lives, there's there's very few there are very few few things that keep them from going back into the life. So, are you working with other similar groups around the city? Very much so. I mean, is there an umbrella group? Um, well, there are umbrella groups in in different pieces of work that we do. So, for instance, some of the education work, mm -hmm. we we work with things called um, CEJ Coalition for Econ um, Educational Justice. We work on the stop and frisk work with. Um, with a, with a with a, a citywide organization that is doing that, um, so in all the different pieces of work, in order to have because you know we, we're trying to have a local impact, but ultimately we're trying to have a citywide and statewide impact too, and so you can't do that, you know, unless you are in not just in a in a in a coalition, but you are a functioning and active member of that coalition and are bringing the perspective of your neighborhood into that, into that coalition. What would the city say if you somehow were able to uh, find a way to make your group a bid? Uh, a bid as in a business improvement Yeah, district? but it's not a business. It's a community <laughs> support group. I hear you. To get some of the advantages. I would, I would love that. I mean, I would love what we do to be modeled. Yeah, it's I, just I, I would love templates to be yeah. You know, and, and I have to say, if there's any administration who would be up to it, this I, is it, I yeah. think this is it. I think this is our opportunity. Yeah. You have there. to really work because yeah. we want to be sure that it stays for a while. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then you have the national, I mean, we've talked before about Andrew Friedman, who was one of the founders of Make the Road. Right. And then he has this national organization now right. where he comes in and they come, this organization comes in to help with right. forming other groups. Exactly. Do they have national meetings? Um, they are. They do have national meetings, and they're they're part of a, a national network, and they do national work. And what you're speaking of is make the road by walking, and then became make, make, make the, the road, road New York. Yeah. Um, and then he went, and, and then he went and started um, Center for Popular Democracy, which in a, in a, many ways was trying to replicate mm -hmm. that work locally across the country. But even make the road is not even a local organization anymore. I mean, it's 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 doing work I think in three different boroughs right now. Mm -hmm. And is, is focused mostly on immigration issues, but um, Center for Public Democracy is, is gone beyond that. What, what's interesting with, with de Blasio is not only what promise for people like a, you know who want change within the city, but it sent ripples nationally about mm. the whole different emphasis. <clears throat> so you're back to your own economic justice stuff in right. a way when you started the uh, 
the credit union. Right. I mean, this is an opportunity nationally. And though you pick up the paper and they say it looks like the Congress may be Republican in the Senate <laughs> exactly. and the House. So what's discouraging? Well, I mean, New York <laughs> is always seen as an outlier on some on some level, you know. So I don't I don't know how much this breeze will will go across the, the rest of the of the land, but I think that if 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 the Blasio administration and us progressives do a bang up job, then that will demonstrate that progressive administrations and progressive infrastructure is 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 a credible alternative in I don't want to put a damper, but I don't, <laughs> I, because of my age, I guess, I don't like the word progressive. Mm -hmm. And somebody the other day said, progressive shows the failure of us with Newt Gring Gingrich, because mm -hmm. he gave liberal such a bad name. Mm. And then when you think back in history, I mean, Roosevelt, Social Security, all the, right, the labor right. laws, everything else, they were progressive. Right. So why are we always, a fr you know, this progressive business, it still has a generational difference. I, I, I think so. I mean, and, and I'm not scared of the word liberal, but I do think that liberal has certain connotations that, that progressive doesn't. And I, and I think progressive... What are they? Well, I think progressive is a more self-conscious and more realistic on some level, and I can already see your body language. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it's a more conscientious sort of grappling with privilege um, that... that that we enjoy and going from less of a place of of guilt and um, to more of a place of we have to have this discussion because we've come to the end but right what I think you may what when you said guilt and all that brought me to the white involvement of the civil rights movement right right but I'm f before that Gotcha. Anyway, gotcha. it's lovely to talk to you. I certainly to wish to you. you lots of luck. Thank you. And I do hope you run for public office. Well, thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>